Hi, this is Brennan Harris from VMV Nation reporting live from the Brady Bunch Crack Den here in downtown Austin, Texas. You're watching Raw Time. We're about to get ready for our show in true beautiful style. And uh, I'd like to say thanks for watching the show and thanks for listening to the music. We're all beautiful. Hey, this is Kurt uh, from Raw Time with Summer and Ronan from VMV Nation. Hello, good evening. We're here to interview Ronan. So we had some questions. And First question is, uh, Matter and Form is VNV's fifth album to come out, mm -hmm. and uh, how, we'd like to know how the songwriting has changed uh, to give this album a new sound. Uh, how has VNV Nation changed as a band uh, to give such a, a different commercial sound to this new album? I wouldn't call it commercial because I don't know a radio station that will play it. Um, it's well recorded, I think that's probably the only difference. I used a producer rather than a computer and so we're sitting at home in a room. I think most bands in this scene uh, record things on a budget, but uh, if you drop back about 10 years, any industrial band was using major studios and it seems to have gone off by the wayside because, you know, technology at home has become accessible to everybody. So most bands are using very sort of lo-fi techniques to make records, which is fine, but it's become the accepted sound. I just wanted, um, uh, I've reached a point where I wanted, I had in my mind how I wanted this album to sound. I wanted a very organic vibe to it. I wanted to have smatterings of all my favorite albums. And um, the only way I could do that was go to a producer and say to him, listen, but I want it to sound like this, and this is how I want this right. to feel. But I write the songs, and I write the, I, I program, and I write the lyrics, and I write the, um, and I, I sing, and I do most of the production. So um, nothing has actually changed, other than I just, you know, it's been three years since the last album, and I just wanted something that sort of, with every album I've always gone off and done something that well, I The reason I, I said commercial was uh, I've been reading a lot of different like chat forums and mm -hmm. things like that and people say that this album sounds a lot cleaner and a lot more yeah. well produced. Right. And, I, I think yeah commercial in, the, in that sense and that it can be accessible to people but uh, you know we've never had any problem being accessible to people in the past. I think the, the difference was that if you hear an album you're just hearing melodies. Sorry you'll have to excuse my voice but I've been doing a lot of sort of yelling and stuff on stage and you get the stage smoke right and it just wrecks your throat. Um, uh, there's, I don't think there's any harm in having like a well-produced album. It's something I'd like to that I wanted even in the past. It's just that I, I never had the resources, never had you know, it was never accessible. We finance everything ourselves. Right. We're not on a major label. We have our own label, um, so we pay for all these things. And um, I just said uh, after the last album, okay, I did it with a PC. It sounds great, fine, but it's just uh, it didn't have the vibe that I wanted. If you think about like what your favorite albums are, you never really realize why it is that you like it. But there's this underlying tone to how things sound not just the melodies or not just the singing or whatever. Um, think of maybe sort of late 70s recordings or say your favorite records in the 80s or your favorite records in the 90s. Um, there are records that sound great because they use certain recording techniques. We use a lot of lo-fi techniques, a lot of hi-fi techniques. We use like 70s technology and, and 21st century technology to mix it together. But the end result was that I just wanted to write an album of songs. And I mean, that can also be instrumentals. It can be um, songs where I sing. I think some people got a bit hooked on my voice, which is a bit weird because I didn't like it instrumentals on the album. But right. we've, yeah, always, reading about that well, we've always had instrumentals on our album, so it's kind of a misnomer when people say there's too many instrumentals on it. There have always been one. When right. There's always been instrumentals on the No, it's more than that. Oh yeah, um, some people count the intro, which is a minute and a half, but if they want to, that's okay. If we don't count the intro, it's got the same number of instrumentals on Praise the Fall, which was the album that launched us, so I don't see any real difference. Well, leading into that, um, I noticed that it wasn't dependent that was yeah. releasing the album anymore. So what's this? Is it Anacron Sounds? Anacron Sounds, yes. What is that all about? It's our own label. We uh, we left. We had. Uh, one album deals with Dependent and after the last tour the Future Perfect tour we parted ways and we wanted to uh, find out where we go with this there was this big movement because you know we're, I'm based in Germany there was a big movement of like major subdivisions trying to sign up labels and uh, our publishing company were trying to suggest to us that we go and talk to some big players I have absolutely no interest in working with a major label whatsoever so um, I met some because I wanted to get chits and giggles out of hearing them offer me money and they did and one label offered me a ridiculous amount of money because you know the majors were losing serious amounts of money they had no idea where music is going they were trying to sign up bands left right and center hoping grasping at the draws and something right and the reason those bands are successful is that they're on small labels not because they're on majors as soon as they join the major you have a totally different perception about the band we make music we like we do our own cover arts we do our own t-shirt designs we do everything ourselves we've always been like that um, and this was our chance for us to do everything ourselves. And we thought, well, we have all the people around us who will do our promotion and all the people who do our press and everything else, so why do we need a label? We know how to do this ourselves, so we do it ourselves. We 
license it off to labels. We have a lawyer deal with that. You know, like any smart band would just have a lawyer and say, listen, man, I don't know how this contract thing works. You deal with it. And he goes off and does it. And everything works out great. It's actually not as difficult to do. You've taken a lot of flack for um, not enough change between Praise the Fallen and Future Perfect. Now with this album, this recent album... I get flack for changing too you much. Got, yeah, you've got people complaining that now it's too different. What do you, what do you think... They either like it or they don't. The majority, What's the problem? I mean, no, the you... majority of our fans actually love the album I received. As I told the previous interview, I received one email from somebody who didn't like the album. I've seen people comment about it online, and actually uh, we have people, especially the record companies, that they, not field for us, but they, their members are about you know, 200 groups, and they go and read up what the responses are. The majority of our fans absolutely love the album. There are those who are purists who always want you know, any band to record the same album that they loved over and over and over. Um, I remember Henry Rollins saying something about this with Black Flag, that you know they had this experience that you know when they went off and tried to do something different, people didn't like it. And they said, well, you know, a band has to evolve, and a band is never one sound. It moves with the person in time, with their experiences. You're definitely not the person you were when you were 16. You're definitely not the person uh, you are now. You're not going to be that person when you're 35. So uh, life is an evolution, and so are your musical tastes. And, and um, I wanted this album still to be to have the key elements of what the Nation is, i.e. the emotion and maybe the, the, the thought and the, the philosophy and what have you. But um, it still has the same range of things on the album that we've always had. And in, in principle, you know, we've always had these slow orchestral tracks, we've always had ballads, we've always had the, the, the instrumental club sort of goa type thingy, whatever. Um, and we've always had the hard-hitting club track with the catchy chorus. I mean, you right. know, ostensibly, there's absolutely no difference between this album on those factors as, as anything previous. Future Perfect, I think, was actually quite a big change from Praise the Fallen. I think it was actually the one thing that people didn't like was that they, it had gotten brighter and happier, mm -hmm. and they wanted it to stay grandiose and, and whatever. And I kind of see those people, no, no offense to them, I mean, if they like that album, that's great. Me, personally, I don't like bands, I like albums or I like songs. I've never liked a band. Um, I don't think there's a single band that have ever satisfied me with every single release, so I don't expect anyone else to feel like that. Um, this album is actually, and Future Perfect, have brought in a lot of new fans who like us from totally different backgrounds. We've got hardcore kids, punk kids, uh, kids who like general alternative music, kids who like dance music coming to our shows, and they're going nuts about it, but they hear it from a totally different perspective. And they're hearing this album, and it's having the same reaction for them as, as other people who heard, say, Empires for the first time and thought, wow, this is an incredible album. Um, those who heard Empires and had the reaction to it would love it to always have that vibe for them. And you can't have that. It's like getting your first ice cream by the time you get Here's me talking about food again. <laughs> um, by the time you had your third ice cream, the whole taste, you know, the, 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 the initial impact is gone. So it's, um, it, it's, just the, it's just the motion of things. I'm very accepting of that. And I don't think we've, we've betrayed anybody. And I don't think we've, we just do what we do. We've always done what we've done. There were people who hated Beloved because it was a chick track, right? You know, this word chick track, I hate that because I think Beloved is in many ways was a quintessential V&V song because it was just one other example of the emotion that's in our music whether that be dark foreboding you know introspective emotion or very outward expression of, of love or passion for somebody they're all elements of what the Nations music is about which is a sway of human emotion a sway of philosophy and like your, your way of looking at the world we're alternative people in an alternative culture we have our own way of looking at the world we have to come up with our own philosophies because general society won't give them to us because they don't accept us and don't provide for us so we come up with our own way of seeing things and that's right. kind of what we're about You've said that your music um, is influenced by a lot of philosophy, no, literature. I, 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 well, I wouldn't, that has taken a, a role within the lyrics, I would say, yes, for sure. Is there a certain type of philosophy or a certain philosopher that um, seems to kind of go above all the other ones that influences you the most? Um, no, I no. would say I'm, I'm too much of a, a student of life in that I've read um, and studied far too much because I just constantly want to see what everyone's opinion was. Oddly enough, the title Matter and Form comes from a philosophical concept. I'm going to sound really sort of, I don't know, deep and pretentious and wanky here for a second. Um, the title Matter and Form comes from a philosophical concept from the origins of science where, hang on a second, let me get that for you. Um, people didn't have a clue what, you know, made anything or what anything was made of. And Aristotle came up and said, everything is basic substance. And then you form it into something and that's matter. And this is when it becomes a glass, it's form. And then you have these metaphysical philosophers in the 1600s who said it was about spirit, it was about potential, and my take on it was, um, it's uh, it was just my, I suppose, 
a pseudo-intellectual take on um, turning potential into ability, which is something that a lot of alternative people can do. They are creative. They are to dis yeah, right. You're just gonna you, you cultivate your own personality, you cultivate your own image and your own style, but you, you have within yourself great ability by virtue of the fact that you, you somehow stand out from the norm. Uh, realizing that was something I never realized I, I had in me until you know a late stage in life. I, I meet twenty year olds who think, When am I gonna be famous? When am I gonna be a musician? And I said, Well, you know, I was thirty and something like clicked, so what do you mean? You know, I, I can't tell you, I can't put a date on it. It happened. Um, I, um, I guess I do a lot of reading where I say, yeah, I agree with that or I don't. I very much have my own opinion. Um, I'm not arrogant in that. I'm always willing to learn, always willing to bend my opinion and change it based on information that I guess. But um, this take with matter and form is that, you know, every person is, is somehow a potential blank sheet of paper um, that can be transformed into something they themselves transform that. And you, you have the, the, the control over that. Um, we all have within us dreams of grandeur or dreams of becoming something great. And, and for our Ourselves, not to prove to other people, not to prove to mom and dad or the kids at school that you were something, but um, to to prove to yourself that yes, you had it in you. You always knew that you were better than what other people thought you were. It's a misnomer again. The, the idea is that um, Forsaken I never wanted to record the vocals on uh, because the song was way too personal. Uh, actually I couldn't sing it in the studio because I'd have to do multiple takes and it's a song that comes out through getting myself in that frame of mind and um, singing it. Saviour wasn't finished because we were rushing to finish the album. So we had the vocals taken but we hadn't uh, we had them recorded but we couldn't put them into right. the mix in time. So I said alright fine it'll be a fun it'll be a side of throwing to the, the idea of Burning Empires was already there, we knew we were going to do it. And we did the vocal version of it later on. Um, in itself then, and it was kind of actually a compliment because everybody was debating at the time which one they liked more or not. And there was this one guy going, I hate the vocal version. It's like, they just listened to the <laughs> instrumental. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. Right. I don't get that. I really don't get that. No, no. I, don't, I don't believe so. I okay. This, um, this question is from a fan. So, how exactly do you feel about Epsilon Minus and the whole Sim Ronin thing, and uh, how are things with Fruiter Shaft? And what one, of the, one, of the, one at a time, can we split them up? Okay, okay. All well, right, we'll go do, ahead and okay. the first part. How, how do you um, feel about the whole Epsilon Minus thing? As, as I said to him, um, I think it was one of the best adverts we'd ever got. Um, the day it started, um, I took offense to the fact that he used my name. I said, like, you know, call yourself something else. If you're going to do a parody, it'd be funny, because I love parodies, and I do like, uh, we have a very strong sense of humor. Uh, we always have live. There were just, I think, people who didn't know the band. We thought we were, like, really depressing, introspective, uh, po-faced uh, gits who stood on stage talking about how deep their soul was. I never realized that we do actually stand-up comedy at our shows at times. It has happened. 
and um, I thought it was really funny because somebody knew exactly who it was the day it started. So um, I used to live in Toronto, and he used to, the town was from not too far. So I had a friend of mine right there, find his house. We took a photograph in front of his house. We were going to use it, and I had a friend of mine in the local police force. And we were going to have him arrested for a suspicion of hacking. And we had all these things planned. And then I kind of called a halt to it because, it, you know, um, they were trying to take the piss out of our fans for being so fanatical. And yet the people who were visiting the page, he started to hate them because they were more fanatical. But they were fanatical about being cynical, fanatical about ripping something down. It's like, if you don't like it, just fuck off and listen to something else. You know, that's my opinion. What is your reaction to Nooner Shot? We're at Bruder Shot. Um, we do a lot of things for charity and always have done in, in private, to be honest because I think in America, one of the things we were very afraid of um, was the cynicism that people might have. Uh, I know there was some kind of golf fest that happened where everyone thought the money was going to a certain charity and the money was actually disappearing going off somewhere else. That actually happened in Houston. Right, I think that, that right. was it. And the thing is that that destroys people's faith in it. We did a, a thing called the EHW in Germany, which is um, uh, Elektronisches Hilfswerk, which is a parody on a, or kind of a variation on a name of a big charity uh, thing that happens in Germany. And we had four bands, and uh, we raised uh, $70,000 for three charities with three concerts and a DJ event. And we do things in them. It was incredible. Everybody worked for free. Everybody did as much as the bus company was giving us everything that cost. Everybody who could give us something was giving us something. Everybody in the industry jumped up and said, let's do it. And it was a whole gang of people working together. And it was one of the best things that ever happened because the magazines went AWOL. You know, really big press for this scene in, in Germany. And um, the response, I mean, every concert was absolutely wall to wall. People were going mental because the vibe was just benevolent. Um, we were a bit weird about it over here because we thought, well, if we did something like that, there's still always going to be these cynics. Right. And um, I don't really want to, you know, pollute the sense of what we're trying to do. So what we've done is we've picked concerts. You know, we always do that. We've picked concerts and said, all right, the theme from that concert's going to this. And we do things like that because that's a better way to do it, I suppose. It avoids the, it achieves the result. Um, the whole point with the Brutal Shaft and EHW shows, the whole thing behind it was that, if you've got a certain amount of success, you can use it to, 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 to good ends. It's not a public relations exercise. And somebody actually, there was only one person in Germany to give you a scope of how cynical things are in, in Europe. They aren't. They just aren't cynical. Um, one person slagged off the HW thing and said it was just a promo for bands like Comic Quest and Amnam Baloo and SITD and us. And I said, really? All those bands had offers of festivals over Christmas. All those bands we turned down, I would say, about... 25,000 euro, it's about $35,000 just to do those. And we're playing to the same people who buy our records right. and come to our concerts anyway, so exactly how is this a public relations exercise? We're not exactly being voted man of the year. I don't have my picture on Time magazine, so right. um, it's, you know, the world's full of wankers, but anyway. Um, I love the British after. I think what it was was, was special at the time. Um, I would love to think, to think that it has the same impact, but I think some people want the same lineup to be the same for every single song. It was a good song. I was uh, I was surprised at the reaction, to be honest. But I was just very happy that we all worked together because all the musicians we all know each other for years, and um, we were really happy to have something to do with it and something asking. <laughs> Yeah.
Actually, uh, it seems that <laughs> you're about to say, speaking of man on man action, <laughs> man action, and you're kind of lube do you use? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> speaking uh, of Europe, it, it seems that in the states the scene has actually died down a little bit. Uh, I would say bollocks to that. And uh, so that's your opinion on it. Then uh, in Europe, it's always it's always seemed to be taking off and, and going in new, new directions. And, it uh, changes. In the early 90s, I was living in Toronto, which was supposed to be one of the industrial hubs of music, and you could barely fill a fucking club. It was, uh, it was embarrassing at times to sit in a club with 30 people all listening to Down In It by Nine Inch Nails and sitting around waiting for Headhunter to come on and thinking, great, here we go, the stairway to heaven of industrial music plays again. Um, it's, it's changed. That's all it's done. In actual fact, I think one of the coolest things that's happened in the European scene is DJs, instead of playing the same 20 songs on whatever shuffle play CD that they're given every week that they're going to play repeatedly for two years, um, they're playing a lot of different genres of music alongside it that fit. So you'll guess all the... Um, it's kind of kept things alive because, there's, to be honest, most people in the genre, if you want to call it a genre, or in the scene, or people who go to the clubs, they're going for, they like alternative music. And, and our scene is part of what is just termed in Germany as alternative music. And it's very much alive. The clubs are very full, they're packed out, and people listen to lots of different things. Like there's bits of Electro Clash getting played, there's bits of indie rock getting played. Green Day do not have huge commercial success in Germany, so they can get played and people actually think it's funky and cool because they don't oh, wow. understand the lyrics. You know, I mean, the, the fact is, it's it's a miracle that that sort of stuff gets played alongside industrial music. But I'm saying as a as a, a sim symbolically, it's really cool to hear Interpol being played in a club alongside industrial music because, to be honest, there are a shitload of people who like Interpol who like you know music out of our genre. Oh yeah, like the main mm, like that. that they have stand. no success in Germany whatsoever. Really? Absolutely none. They're huge. Oh, I know, I know that. And I've been, a, I've been an Interpol Paul fan since I first heard of them. I, I heard PDA when it was put online. The record company Matador Records put it online on their, on their website. And my friend said, "Get this now." Now I'm 37, so I remember Joy Division. It was one of my favorite bands in the early 80s, and I know Interpol get compared to them a lot through Image or whatever. Joy Division didn't wear suits all the time, but anyway. Um, it's uh, it's got a certain sense of that beautiful melancholy, this this cold melancholy. Bands like The Faint, bands like Death in Vegas, even Ziggur Ross, they just don't have huge success in or any kind of massive um, play or or even awareness. People aren't aware of them in Germany as they are here. What I think is really cool is over here you've got this huge sway of, of creative music. I mean, okay, you've got all the bands with the the at the beginning, but it's allowed, it's opened a door for a ton of bands who don't sound like the Strokes or, right. you know, um, the, the oh, whole, the, yeah, basically all of these bands who, who go around secondhand clothing stores trying to look like people from the late 70s who dressed like that in the late 70s because they had no clothes to wear right. and they were poor, but now you'll spend over $150 on a jacket with patches on the sleeve so you can look like somebody from the late 70s who had no money. Keeping it real. Um, the thing I find weird is that, you know, you've got this sway of huge creative sway of music, even a band like the Postal Service, no one would have listened to them like five years ago. But they're, the door's been open for bands like right. that, whether you like it or not, or the bravery or anything like that. That's what's really cool that's happening over here. And people in Europe don't even know about it. In, in, in the UK they do. They're really big on that. They're very in tune with the American scene of things. On the mainland in Europe, it's just not like it here. They've just n disconnected from the rest of the world. You have a lot of fans, like, just really are kind of almost obsessive about your music. Um, there, you have some fans that actually like kind of go and like go into like the depth and try to like pick apart your lyrics and see exactly what you were thinking. What do you think it is? I mean, you've got a huge following. What do you think it is? What part of the music you make do you think that it causes I, that I, reaction of people? I, I don't, I, I've actually, to be honest, I've, I've thought about this a lot because I've met, um, I always have time like, okay, there's different variants of, of, of fans. There are those people who come up to me and they want to share an experience with them about how a song has helped them or how a song has inspired them. And if honestly, if I had Marcus heard them, uh, so he's, he's, he's witness to that. Um, if you heard, and I'm not talking a small number, the vast number of people coming up and bearing their fucking soul to you and telling you what this music has done for them in ways that you never thought you would ever change somebody's life. For example, um, giving up drugs, going back to college because of a song. Uh, making up with your parents, going back to college and becoming a, a lawyer. Um, getting out of bed while dying of cancer. Um, I heard that from somebody's parents. Um, 
these things have really floored me and I always have time for everybody who tells me their little story and that's not an invite for people to make stuff up, I mean, um, for attention. Although invariably I, I suspect that there's probably that element but um, there are people who have come up and you know when you see them and when you hear from them that what they're saying is as real and as honest and as true as it can be and I mean it's it floors me and it, it puts me in a sense of perspective that I have to wonder why and how and I don't actually have the, the honest answer. I think over here I always use the excuse that the, the lyrics were in English so Europeans didn't get it as much as North Americans. That's actually not as true. There's, there's a lot of fans who go out and spend a huge amount of time translating semantically perfectly the lyrics. Um, there's a cultural, there's a vacuum of meaning in North America as there was in the UK. Very much the consumerism society uh, you're all expected to conform and be, you know, um, happy little individuals. Um, there's always been alternative music in, in the United States and it's always been fanatically followed. You only have to look at a band now like, let's say, AFI. You think of what the Dead Kennedys following was like back in the, the early 80s. Um, they were seen as a, a, a spokes uh, band for what people were feeling at the time. We get people who come to us and say this music reflects how they feel and says everything about what they think and how, who they are as people. There are those who take it a little bit further, um, and I invite those people to calm down. I had a guy actually come up to me one day, he was so scared to talk to me, he actually wet his pants, and I felt so I just didn't. I'm a very compassionate person in my own way. I didn't know how to react, and his girlfriend said, Pity me. And I tried to break this, this thing up, you know, and, and say, Look, um, it's all right, we are these normal guys. We, okay, what we do, we stand up on the stage, and I understand that may look like amazing, but. At the end of the day, when we walk off the stage, we're living normal lives and we're doing normal things. And we're, uh, if you want to talk with us, we'll be happy to sit down. Um, I think that was easier a couple of years ago. When we came back into the mini tour at the beginning of the year, it was insane. I couldn't leave backstage in two venues because people were just, you know, clawing. And I thought, look at me. I'm not, you know, um, I'm not some Adonis or anything like that. You know, I'm a, I'm a short, sort of stocky, balding guy, and um, and that's what I am. But there's people who just want to share their thoughts and share their feelings. And it's an amazing honor and it's an amazing compliment when people do that. But um, it's odd what you say about people analyzing things within the lyrics. There was one guy who was having a fight with one of his best friends over the lyrics to the word savior. And when I explained the meaning to him, it totally destroyed him because it was nothing that either of them had thought. And then he was coming back to me and trying to convince me that his interpretation was actually correct. <laughs> You're like, I wrote it, man. I wrote the song. I know what it's about. It's about little idiots who set themselves up as the all-knowing, all-seeing eye and the gurus and people who follow them because they need light and meaning in their lives. Oddly enough, the irony being that I may be <laughs> seen as that, I hope not. Um, the... Um, you know, you were saying, like, why, why are people so fanatical? It's like you can ask that of Davey from AFI, and he says that a lot of people that come to their shows are people who just don't feel they fit in. And um, they were young, and they're going through the experience we all went through, which is alienation. I mean, I don't know what we call it alienation. I just didn't want to hang around with the folks in school who looked like the way they did, because they were jocks, and they were... I went to a boys' school up until the age of about 15, and I mean, going to a Catholic boys' school is just like, that's, you know, prison sentence. Um, I was the one with the weird hair, I was the one with the weird clothes and trying to incorporate it into a school uniform because to be honest, I just didn't want to be like them. That wasn't my image, that wasn't, I wasn't trying to react against them. I could have come in, if I want to react against them, I could have come in wearing a plastic bag. That would have been perfect, easy, simple reaction. I want to express myself, this is who I was, and if they weren't prepared to accept me, well, okay, that was hurtful and whatever at the time because I was a young kid, but um, that's the way it was, and that's what I had to come to terms with, and I had to get to grips with that. And soon, like, every, like the rest of us, we find other people like ourselves, and we do our thing, and we feel, I may be, some of my friends are rockabillies, some of my friends are punks, some of my friends are into mental underground screaming, screeching techno music, but I don't care. We all have something in common, because we're all, we all think alike, we're actually able to have a really cool conversation, we're all able to go to a movie and actually analyze the thing. We're not into, you know, sit down and breed our culture, you know, we just sit on the couch with a remote control and eat corn chips all day. Um, I don't know, <laughs> well, maybe there are people out there sitting there watching this going, ah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> with the remote control of the corn chip. This is probably this family, you know? It's, 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 it's something. <laughs> no, I just had to add that in. Sorry, I didn't tell anybody to buy them, and I don't want you to buy them.
been to Austin. I've got a lot of friends from here. Last year I had some people from a club meeting up with me in a hotel and the Red Gothic traffic were from here. And the thing I've always noticed about people from Austin is they have very little accent. I have met tons of other people from Texas and they walk up and it's just like, it's not even a draw, it's just like an announcement. It's like dun, 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 playing music and waving our Lone Star flag and stuff. Um, you just expect like, you know, sort of brushing sort of cow shit off the shoes and stuff like that as they come off the ranch. I actually know one guy who works on a ranch, um, which is kind of weird and freaky. I'd like to go and visit that one day just to see what these people are really like and just stand there going, wow, it's freaky. Um, no, but I, I, I always got the feeling um, from people I've known from Austin over the years, and I met them, you know, long before I was doing music, that it was a really, the, it was a, as a reaction, I guess, maybe to Texas, I don't know, but there's a lot of really cool people from here, a lot of very open-minded people, and uh, more of, sort of, I don't like this word liberal, because I think it's a, it's a word that loses its meaning, because it becomes seen in terms of the opposite end of the extreme, which is conservatism. So, um, the thing is, like, uh, yeah, why not? I mean, the booking agent said you want to play in Austin, but I'm playing Dallas. It's like, okay, I have to look at the map again to see how close they are. Yeah, they're <laughs> sufficient distance apart. Yeah, that's cool. All right, let's do this. So here we are. Uh, we played San Antonio last right. time, and that was brilliant. It was a very unusual. It was thing. a great show. Were you there? Yes, and so it was. That's right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we have a we have a memory of that event because we all ended up in a. I believe we ended up in a Denny's afterwards, right? There was one thing which our merchandiser absolutely loved because nobody ever noticed he was wearing. Jukes and Hazard t-shirts and he's got this whole kind of he's from Philly and he's got this whole kind of like I want to get a reaction out of people from the South. Now, I absolutely love the South. Don't ask me why but I absolutely love it. We were in Charlotte, we were in Nashville and uh, I was just in love with the place. I mean I just want to and Atlanta as well. Um, I love the way people talk and I love the way they are and one of the coolest things about playing in a place like that is that the audience is incredibly appreciative because they don't feel they get any bands through. That's news to me. It's like I didn't know that. I thought like bands were through every week playing smaller shows, but still playing shows. And I met so many amazing, unpretentious, very funny people you can interact with. You can actually have a joke with in the middle of the gig. Unfortunately, in Nashville, I went and did something very bad. Um, being Irish, I don't react very well to hot temperatures. I walk around with a t-shirt when it's like 32 degrees. And um, on stage, it was about 120 degrees. So I don't think the air was. It was switched on, but it was set to hot, very hot. And I walked off stage after going through the last song and I thought, I'm not going to make this. Went into the, went, was walking up the hallway from backstage to try and cool off and get some water over. And um, I walked in and all I saw was a chair. The whole room started to spin. The last thing I remember seeing down in the chair. Apparently I was lying on the floor for 15 minutes doing stand up comedy. Well, lie down with the towel when towels on my head comedy. If it's a new form. It's going to be a beautiful thing. You can have all these people coming on going, hey, how you doing? Well, the evening at the improv, lie down, have towel wrapped up. And I was doing this kind of like distant, inaudible voice, giving people advice and bequeathing my possessions to them. So it was ours. But um, no, that was the, that, that's the first time in my life I've ever passed out. Serious. And I mean, me, a professional drinker, you know? Um, after much experimentation, I've never managed it. So I was quite surprised by that. But that was about the only, that's, that's the weirdest experience. But the people were so unbelievably appreciative for the fact that we'd actually shown up. And I thought, oh, okay. I, that's, that's an incredibly humbling experience. Charlotte was great. People were just brilliant. Absol I, I didn't see where the city was because it seemed that the venue was out in the middle of the countryside somewhere. Um, maybe they hide it somewhere. It's all underground or whatever. But Or it doesn't really exist or something. It's just a legend. You know, All the roads tell you they're taking you there, but they lead you away from it and take you to Raleigh or Rally. And um, the, I just love the fact that when you meet people, they're very, very down to earth and very honest. You go, you go to New York and you meet people and they're brilliant audiences in New York, but they're kind of like, yo, what's up? Very defensive. Yeah, very, very defensive and real kind of like, you gonna mug me? Or do you want an autograph? What do you want? <laughs> you got a gun? All right, grand. Okay, at least just so I know. Um, LA is, is kind of different and uh, I love playing in LA. It's a mental experience, but it's always kind of like people who kiss you one foot from your face. Kind of like the whole kind of, oh, oh, it's so lovely to see you. And uh, I, I think California is brilliant. It's just, it, that's the thing about the United States. It's the most unique place on the planet. Every state is practically like a, com is like a country all on its own. Yeah. And I mean, you know, Texas is the size of France. People compare Austin to uh, San Francisco, but with cheaper rent a lot. And I think it's because of um, how eclectic it is. And we, we, 
Did have, people gravitate to here, like from people? They come from I, I ran from Houston to here as okay. soon as I could. That's, uh, I mean, it was like for us, it was London. London was the center of music. It was where if you wanted your dreams, that's where you went. And I was living in Dublin, which is Ireland. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. Amazing place to visit. Don't ever grow up there. Don't ever grow up there. Really, it's it. They, <laughs> the thing about the, the, that Ireland that I absolutely adore is the people are astoundingly friendly. When you're part of the local tapestry, everybody wants to tell you what your problem is. And everybody has this, they seem that they, they, they feel they've got you summed up in one sentence, ah, you know, and, and they love to tell you you've failed. And that's why Victory Not Vengeance was my slogan in the 80s. And there's this thing that a lot of people ask questions about because I said, I'm leaving this country, I'm getting out, and I'm not coming back because I want to see the world, and I'm never coming back ever to have some asshole tell me that I've failed. Right. Because I will not give them... Um, as we say in Ireland, I wouldn't give them the soot, meaning I wouldn't give them the credit to, or even the chance, the satisfaction, just to stand there and laugh at me for something that they have never done in their life, that they have never even tried to achieve more than just being a sad insurance broker. You know, that's that's the most their life will add up to. I go, you know, I went to Ireland a couple of weeks ago, just between the European and the American tour, and I'm walking around a supermarket with my mum. And my mum's, you know, she's an old woman now, and she's like trying to get a coat and stuff. And we're, we're going up to, to the local women's shop, you know, for older women. And uh, I meet this guy I haven't seen since school, which is a long time ago. And I say, I'm great, I'm good at this. And he's standing there with his sad, horrible kids. And one of his kids has got a piercing, and he's got the ring through his nose, and he's like, you know, kind of like this to dad the whole time. Like, I don't give a shit what you say. And I'm standing there laughing, you know, and you were like asshole at school, hating me because I was different. Now deal with it, man. Now, now it's your great. kid. <laughs> Oh, the irony of life, it's beautiful. So they are uh, probably, probably like, I don't know, one day I'll probably have kids and uh, then I'll have like these really, Mummy, when are we going to the opera? <laughs> or like, Daddy, I want to go play rugby. I want to go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more, more like walking around Washington University sort of sweatshirt and kind of like chino, chino shorts and stuff. And oh dear God, going out and pick up trucks and... Yeah, but I won't go into that, that, that sad image of frat boys, but it's... <laughs> well, uh, Austin's full of those, because we, really? we have the University of Texas, it's a college town. This is going to be my, um, my last question, and then I guess I'll let you ask one more, if you have one. Um, I, I know, I mean, personally, I mean, we're both fans, so this was like a really cool opportunity, like Future Perfect, I think I drove me crazy, because I listened to it nonstop every Sorry night about for about nine months straight. Um, What's the pig vomit song? <laughs> That's what he thought. Oh, that's what he would structure. Into. Yes. Yeah. Actually, somebody's saying the atomic pig vomit. Yeah, he just no, he just liked to tease me about it. I think I actually um, turned a fan into not a fan for a while. I haven't had a chance to actually get too into this new album because I just, you know, I just got it. Um, but I'm already getting. I mean, when I talked to the fans, they were like, um, "Well, what's?" What's next for VNB? Which is a little bit nice. premature, but sure. Another another album next year. But what's immediately next is um, for those people who would say we have gone off and changed our sound. We've gone and done this. We've done so many different styles of music. Um, there is an obvious perception that we are always the solitary honor, beloved, um, standing sort of thing because that's what the DJs played to death. Um, more is the pity because I think in many, in many ways they actually turned people off what I thought were well Solitary was a very important song for a lot of people for a long time and then suddenly it lost all its meaning because it's been it's like saying a word over and over yeah so and you start to despise it because it becomes this trendy cool thing and it's like we become the Debbie Gibson of EDM you know or the Britney Spears why do I keep calling Debbie Gibson today I don't know why it's actually just, she represents congeniality she had one track and that was it you know that was her on her little merry-go-round thing and we all hated her for it we all yay Debbie go on one hit wonder thanks very much all the best close the door on your way
we're not a one-hit wonder. We haven't had a hit yet. I mean, in a small scene, maybe, yeah. yeah. We had singles in the charts and stuff, but, you know, we're just one of those bands that forms the background of alternative culture that's, like, in German terms, it'd be, like, the version of alternative mainstream where one of those bands that everybody knows about, but we're not, like, massively, hugely popular. I mean... I think people again it's people that come up with lines who just love to think they've got some statement I've heard stuff I've read I could make a book out of the crap I've read written about us and I've read things about me as a person that I just originally I got very angry about because I didn't believe people would do this there is an aspect in North America that I cannot understand which is people who make up stuff if it was at least true it'd be great there is stuff that there there is true I'm no angel but it's the amazing amount of sway of stuff where I was apparently shagging someone against the speakers in Chicago during that kind of coil set on the last tour and I thought, really? What are they, like loud music or what? I don't know. I was standing with a Sunblash 23 in the middle of the hall, so I don't know. Maybe Tom Shear wants to shed some light on that story. I don't know. Maybe he remembers something that I don't. Perhaps there was right. some roofie in my drink or whatever, but you never know. Um, it's not make or break. We're on our own label. We're having fun. We do what we do. Um, we want to have... Um, there are going to be speculators. There are going to be those that attractors who love to be the voice of the wisdom that they know everything. They know shit all, to be honest. To be honest. I mean, there they were people who said with Beloved, that that's it, we're going for the charts. Well, really? Are we? If we wanted to go for the charts, we'd be on a major label. And I hate major labels because, to me, a major label is about... You're in a company where you are sitting behind a desk trying to write hits for a label so they can make money. That's the only reason you're there. You're not there for any other reason to be creative or to be alternative or to be what you are. You're there to make hits. And all the bands who got lured off by that from our genre in Germany, who went off the major labels, all lost out. They all failed. And they lost a lot of fans because of it. And that was a real pity for them because they never identified that what made them special was that they were the Interpols or the Faints, that they were the small little band that you felt somehow a personal connection to. Um, there are very few bands that can be on major labels that will have incredible hits. Um, and you'll still feel that they're a small band, like Radiohead, for example. Right. I still see them as this incredibly off-the-wall creative band, and um, and yet they sell millions and millions of records. You know, it's <coughs> true. Well, they can't play Creep unless they do that backward bit, you know, or play the, the only radio "You're So Freaking there, right? Special." But they had that version of it. Right. They played it on London radio. And <laughs> I would just like yell that word out like kind of Jim Morrison did on the Ed Sullivan show you know he's like you're not allowed to say fucking on the show it's like oh okay no problem one two, three four fucking <laughs> just right before the song fucking <laughs> actually that's kind of a cool idea I'm not allowed to sing that line but I can say the word just you before the song <laughs> I'm alright I'm Irish and I swear too much and I'm going to give people a bad impression of me I should actually by all rights have like loads of alcohol sitting next to me and the odd burger since some people seem to think that I'm a, I'm a bur burger specialist <laughs> or something like that which is which is absolutely I haven't heard this one. Oh no the, you don't know about the parody of me right yes, you know yes. about the, the Cimarron it was all these kind of burger perfect songs and everything's about burgers and this and that and the other and they were doing this brilliant photoshop contest which showed amazing talent where they were airbrushing or not airbrushing they were photoshopping my face into various situations right, right. where there was a burger and they had things like uh, the Whistling Mother, the famous painting, and it's my face on the Whistling Mother sitting there with a burger in my hand. And I thought, this is absolutely brilliant. Um, I was a vegetarian, strict vegetarian for a long time. So I, I got back into it. Um, and uh, I never really eat burgers, but the thing was, I was, uh, was going to combine the swords and the burger thing together. I actually had this photo made by a friend of mine where we had this big long, it looked like a hoagie or something like a sub, right? Loads of lettuce and everything, and a plastic sword in it, and it was me going, you know, taking a bite out of the thing. And then I thought, actually, no, I'm honouring a bunch of people who are taking the piss out of right, us, where right. in actual fact our fans value very much what we say and what we sing about. And I'm not going to dishonour them. Yeah. I'm not going to dishonour them, but at the same time, I've got a good sense of humour about ourselves. <laughs> it was pure oil. It was the it was the dick and fart jokes that followed it. It was all the kind of like non-stop frat boy homosexual jokes. It was me, me and Eskel from Covenant were supposed to have a homosexual relationship. And I thought, no, I'm never in a million years. It's not my type. I like curvy men. No, I am. <laughs> men with breasts. So, uh, and uh, the thing was that um, I just thought like, if you're going to be funny, be funny. Be and funny. I think there were, there were moments in it, I think were side splitting and hilarious. But I, some of our fans got so upset about it. And then I said, look, we're not upset. You know, we, we, 
be honest, we have a good sense of humor about it. And then what was really weird was that the DVD came out and everybody saw this past imperfect section and they thought, well, the band actually has a sense of humor. Right. You know, we, we couldn't show obviously everything in that section that we'd filmed and believe me, I think we would have lost fans if we'd had because there were sections of that that we just had to cut right the fuck out. And, um, you know, the, the, there were people reporting on that page when it was still active. And I mean, it's gone by the wayside a long time yeah. now. Um, but it was funny. I think I really still do think it was one of the best adverts we ever had. So any press is good. Press. Any press it's is good press. No such thing as bad press. Well, I think there's a, there's such thing as too much bad press. Like if everyone says you're crap, well, most people, people most people will <laughs> believe it. Most people believe it, and there you are. And you'll end up with Debbie Gibson. There you are. There you she's, go. she's our magic word today. She's flashing up at the bottom of the screen. You know, you must drink four four fingers of Jack Daniels every time you hear the word Debbie Gibson today. That's our contest for the day. Oh, I'm sorry. I told you what to do. I can't do that. <laughs> can't do I'm that. sorry. No corn chips. <laughs> no.